Um, good afternoon, everyone. Let me introduce myself. My name is Rick Drabik, and I'm a counselor working at the Preferred EAP program. Um, I would imagine that most of the people attending today have some level of connection with the Preferred EAP program, um, primarily through working for an employer where we provide the uh, EAP service uh, to the employer and its employees. So each of you uh, have different benefits related to that. So an employee assistance program, as many of you know, is basically a benefit offered by your employer, similar to health insurance or uh, paid time off, dental plans. The EAP is really, the employee assistance program is really the benefit that provides counseling and mental health services uh, to employees. Um, most of you uh, get five free counseling sessions per year, and that usually extends to your, uh, your dependents as well. Um, often that's for each issue that, that you have related, uh, uh, five sessions per issue per year. But you may want to check with your, I'm not sure who the audience is today. I'm, I'm guessing we have people from a variety of employment settings. So check with your HR manager or, or, or your booklets to find out um, what your benefit is. But basically, again, we provide the counseling mental health benefit for employees uh, related to their employers. And we also do educational programs like the one we're doing today. We'll come on site and do these uh, for employers and employee groups. So remember that if you'd like to request us to come out uh, and do something. Currently, we're doing everything virtually. I should just let people know that for the past year with the advent of COVID, everything we've been doing is by telephone or virtually through the uh, uh, platform WebEx. So everything in terms of the counseling sessions, uh, as well as the educational program. So. Our phone numbers are listed there on the screen. You simply call us if you're looking to set up an appointment. Um, we offer evening appointments. Uh, we don't do weekends, uh, but we do have some evening times available. And also we offer Monday through Friday during the day, what we're calling an express consult. You can call into our office and get access to a counselor fairly quickly. We'll get back to you as soon as we can to provide maybe five, 10 minutes, 15, maybe even up to an hour if we can, if that's needed, uh, of a, a quick consultation uh, as on an as needed basis. Again, we've been doing that uh, since the advent of COVID. And so uh, that's who we are. We are located, our primary office is located off of Route 22 off the 15th Street exit. Again, we're not currently in that office, but that is our primary office location when we go back to seeing people in person. It's uh, located in, a, in an area uh, that's sort of off the beaten paths for privacy and confidentiality. But again, you can access us now through those two phone numbers to get uh, educational programs or, or, or counseling assistance. So the topic we're gonna to talk about today is civility in the workplace. This is a topic we've been doing for, for quite some time over the years. Uh, it's been a very popular topic, um, sort of wonder why. Well. We'll talk about that as we kind of move along. Uh, what's civility like in our world? What's it like in our in our workplaces? One of the things that we haven't done is, is done this workshop since the advent of COVID. And so the workplaces have taken on very different shapes and sizes and, and, and how we're working with a lot of people working from home, less people interacting in person and more people acting virtually or by phone or email. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit at the end, but uh, it's a very popular topic over the years. And it's been tweaked a little bit now, given uh, the current state of the world that we live in. Okay, Tyler. So talk a little bit about what civility is. It's behaving in a way that shows regard and respect for others. Being polite and courteous. Being friendly and nice. Speaking kindly to someone who has hurt your feelings. That's, it's, that's interesting because even when we've been treated in a way that is uncivil or has been hurtful to us, um, how do we react back? What do we do? How do we treat them? Which can either help situations or further exacerbate situations. Last part there is civility also helps preserve the norms for mutual respect. It sets up the norms where we all anticipate that we hope all of us are going to act under certain ways. I came across some interesting 
uh, material that was written by George Washington back in the day. He wrote a, a, a piece on uh, etiquette and civility. Uh, and if anybody wants to research that, you know, Google uh, George Washington civility etiquette. And you'll find, I think he listed maybe 20, 30, 40 uh, pieces. It was quite, quite elaborate, but it really serves as a foundation for even many of the things that we talk about today. But uh, it, it is interesting that it's been going on for a while. So in a nutshell, I mean, this is very, very common sense in very many ways. It's, it's how we treat each other, uh, being civil to one another in a kind and courteous and friendly way. Uh, we would all hope that that occurs in our lives and our, in our relationships. It certainly doesn't always, but that's what civility is, being nice to one another. Okay, Tyler. When talking about civility, it's often important to talk about that it's not the same as agreeing. That between any two people, you're actually going to disagree about 80% of the time. So disagreeing is actually normal. We all disagree. Um, we can't disagree with someone and still be civil to them. And maybe people have experienced that. Maybe we've experienced it in the other direction where we disagree with someone and we weren't civil. It didn't, it turned into an uncivil uh, relationship or communication. So it doesn't mean you have to agree with someone because most of the time we do disagree with each other. And that does not mean that it has to lead to a situation of being uncivil. Civility is also not the same as liking someone. No one likes everyone all the time. But we can still be civil to each other and, and civil to all people. So again, uh, important to know is that it's not necessarily about agreeing because we disagree with each other very often. And it's not about liking someone because no one likes everyone all the time. Um, and so just because we don't agree or don't like someone doesn't mean that we can't be civil. Okay, Tyler. So incivility is really the opposite, being rude, discourteous, disrespectful to other people. You know, as we kind of go through this presentation today, what I'd like people to do is, is take the opportunity to, if you have a piece of paper and a pen uh, by, uh, jot down some examples that you feel are, are uh, specific to your own life and how this may be applicable to you. Situations where maybe you've experienced incivility, and we all have, people who have been discourteous or rude to us. Also think of examples where we've been rude to other people, because no one's perfect, we've all done that. Um, we get into little ways about why we do that. But rudeness has been around forever, and it, it, it's never gonna go away. It's a part of human nature in many ways. It's how we manage it, how we monitor it, what we do with it. But you may wanna jot down some real life examples that apply to you. Uh, that you can, as we go through this material, think about how would that apply to my current life and current situations that I've encountered, uh, either currently or over the years. So it's not being considerate of others or un or impact on others. Uh, being uncivil is it, it causes other people discomfort or hurt or pain. We know that we've been on on the other side of someone who's been uncivil. We've we felt that discomfort or hurt or pain. Some workplace examples, some uh, very overt ones are making nasty comments, emotional put downs, disrupting a meeting, um, giving silent treatment uh, to another person, uh, public reprimand. Uh, it's often been said that you should reprimand in private and praise in public. Um, not giving credit where credit is due. Um, giving dirty looks, eye rolling, um, or gossiping are, are sort of real concrete examples of incivility in the workplace. Um, in life in general, uh, but we're talking about workplace in specific with, with some of these. More subtle ways are, are interrupting. These are ways that we're not often aware we're doing. Um, we're not often aware that it's happening. Um, interrupting others, not listening. Asking for input and then ignoring it. Having side conversations, may have experienced this at certain meetings. Uh, hovering over the desk of someone uh, when you want something. Um, that can be seen as rude or discourteous. It's, it's often a difficult situation if you're wanting to get someone's attention and they're working. You know, how do you work out with that person? Um, 
is it a knock? Is it a asking, are you busy right now? Uh, but working out with each person, uh, how can I approach you when you're busy in a way that doesn't come off as rude um, or discourteous or what have you? So those are some subtle examples. Okay, Tyler. So talk a little bit about just civility in general, civility in America. This is a, a study done in, in 2018. If you see the bottom of the page, Weber, Shanwick, Palatate, uh, KR, KRC Research. If people have uh, some questions or would like to get some of the, I didn't uh, notate uh, the exact resources on these, but if people ever want those, please feel, reach, uh, feel free to reach out to me at the EAP program at one of those phone numbers and I'll provide you with the, uh, the resources that I'm using today. But what they do, they've done um, uh, annual surveys for the past 10 years. Uh, the most recent one I came across was the 2018 one. Um, one of the things that they found just in general, that 93% of all people uh, feel there's in, incivility is a problem in our society, 93%. I mean, that's nearly everyone feels that civility, incivility is a problem in general in our society. I am thinking about how times have changed since 2018 in terms of um, the polarization in our political system and the stress related to dealing with COVID and how both of those have probably in either increased that number or amplified that number. Again, this was in 2018 prior to COVID and, and prior to, I think, in some ways, an escalation of our, our political polarization. So I think that's added even, even more so in many ways to issues of civility in our society. 69% feel it's a major problem. 84% state they have experienced instability. 39% talk about experiencing in these areas that tend to be more primary. When we're shopping, and again, this is pre-COVID, most many people shopping now online with, with difficulty or um, avoiding in-person contacts, but in the past in shopping situations, uh, driving situations, also, you know, thinking about road rage, uh, what have you, and on social media, uh, which again has been an, an increase of uh, people using social media. So those are three of the more primary areas where civility, incivility crops up in America. In 2018, people ex talked about experiencing instability 10 times a week versus six times a week in 2016. So just in two years, that uptick and increase. So really what they talk about in some ways is a, a significant problem. Many people experience it and feeling it. Um, those areas that it happens in and, and, and certainly an uptick. So in general, in America. Thank you, Tyler. So if we move that into the workplace, uh, again, this is uh, based off of a, a woman named Christine Porath. We want to jot down the book that she, this comes from and that she has written is called Mastering Civility, a Manifesto for the Workplace. And actually she does a nice piece. She does a TED Talk for people who have viewed TED Talks. If you go to Christine Porath, he does a lot of work uh, on civility in the workplace, and you can find uh, her, her discussions there at a TED Talk. But again, they come out of the book, Mastering Civility, a Manifesto for the Workplace. So what she talks about, of thousands of workers polled between 1998 and 2013, 98% report experiencing uncivil behavior in the workplace. Again, back to, that's pretty much almost everybody. Those who felt they were treated rudely at work at least once, uh, once per week. In 1998, 25%, 2011, 55%, and 2016, 62%. Again, what you're looking at is over the past 10, maybe 20 years, we're looking at an increase, an uptick in incivility, both in society and our workplace. Um, so again, thinking about this being a popular topic that we've offered to workplaces and to people, 
Uh, you can see that many people feel that this is a significant issue in our world, in our society, and in our workplaces. Thank you, Tyler. So what are employees reporting? Nearly nine in 10, 87% report workplace instability as a negative consequence on your on my job or at home. So people are reporting that workplace incivility hurts my job morale, 55% feel it hurts my job morale. 45% makes me wanna quit my job. I mean, the experience is that uh, uh, difficult and negative, but actually people contemplate, this is not where I wanna work, this is not a situation I want to be in, uh, thinking about quitting. 40% feel it leads me to be less collaborative in our workplaces, not working together with people and collaborating, working in silos. 38% makes me feel angry towards my coworkers and employer. Um, that emotion coming into the workplace of anger, very negative, both for ourselves individually and for our work sites. 36% reduces the quality of my work. 32%, it negatively impacts my time away from work so that we actually will take this home um, and bring it home and, and have that negative uh, emotion or thinking about things at work or thinking about things that have been said or thinking about people or, or relationship situations that are uncivil, bring it home to our families and into our personal lives. Uh, one in three people feel that way. 26 people feel it leads me to be less creative, and 23% leads me to call in sick. So, I mean, it can be so troubling that, and, and working with people in workplace situations where they've encountered interpersonal difficulties and, and, and instability, uh, making them actually feel ill, uh, that it's so troubling and so difficult to them, uh, actually even calling in sick, that's almost one in four people there. So. These are what employees report about how workplace instability impacts them. It's quite a list, uh, both in terms of work performance, how it affects you personally, how it affects your relationships, how it affects your life. Uh, very significant. Okay, Tyler. Additional impacts of workplace instability. These are a, a bit repetitive, but productivity suffers. People stop sharing and seeking information. Uh, that's a really difficult one. Again, operating in silos, isolating, uh, disconnecting from others, disconnecting from our, our, our coworkers. Again, employees stop communicating with each other. Um, you lose on performance, creativity, helpfulness, being helpful to one another. Employee concentration actually goes down. There's been some studies that say our cognitive skills, skills drop 30%. And so I, I believe the studies that were done were exposing people to in civil situations and and then doing cognitive testing on, on their ability to reason and think. Um, uh, it's interesting that it really impacts our brains and our, and our cognitive skills. Um, high, at least a higher worker turnover. We talked about people quitting and absenteeism. We talked about people calling in sick. And it can lead to harassments and discrimination. So civility, incivility is a sort of the, the beginning stages of moving to more troubling behaviors of harassment or discrimination. So, you know, instability is sort of the, the milder form of, of troubling interpersonal uh, uh, issues that, again, goes from being subtle to more overt and then can rise to more troubling behaviors. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a little bit. Thank you, Tyler. So what causes that workplace instability? 50% um, talk about feeling overloaded at work. Talking to people in workplace situations, many employers asking employees to do more with less. A lot of people experiencing that. Um, stress is the number one cause uh, of workplace instability. Feeling overloaded with your workload uh, just adds to that. 40% feel I have no time to be nice. That's a crazy statement to me. 
I don't feel I have the time to be nice. I have to keep going, keep moving, do what I need to do to get my work done and to give the extra effort or focus or time to being nice to one another. Um, I don't have the time to do that. Again, that, that sounds kind of crazy for me. Most of us are with the people that we work with uh, for longer periods of time than perhaps our own family members, uh, eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, what have you. And if a workplace is not uh, courteous and kind and, and, and helpful and, and civil, um, that's really a, a, a sad situation to have to exist in. And so not having time to create that environment just kind of uh, uh, doesn't feel okay for me. 25% feel it's because my boss acts that way. Here's a lot from employees that really you're in an environment where the tone is set by your superiors. Um, knowing that bosses as well are under stresses and, 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 and various uh, uh, frustrations. And so what tone do they set? What tone do they pass down? What message do they set down? And often that sort of uh, water falls down into the employee base or, or into uh, the work group. So 25 cents gets my, my boss acts that way. Some other reasons, cultural clashes due to globalization. So with the globalization of businesses uh, coming up against other cultures in other countries, uh, also uh, an increase in, in variety of cultures in our own country here in the United States uh, can lead to misunderstandings and clashes um, around differences. Misunderstandings due to technology. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along as well. But when you're emailing, texting, what have you, uh, you lose um, uh, you, you, you lose uh, body language, you lose certain pieces of the communication that when you're in person, uh, you can pick up on. When it's just a written word, there's often inferring, like, what did that person mean? What did they say there? And so technology can really lead to misinterpretation uh, and negative feelings and, and, and again, uh, incivility. Growth of narcissism amongst younger adults. Um, as I kind of throw some of these things out, I've worked with a lot of younger adults who I don't think are quite as narcissistic. I think many younger adults are more, uh, in some ways, caring and, and more mindful of treating each other. So a lot of what we're putting out today, but I'll put out today in this program, like in many programs, uh, you, can, you can, I don't think there's a lot of certainty. I think different, different situations vary. And I think you have to think about, think about your situation and, and the specifics that apply for you. And a general lack of self-awareness that may be connected to our busy workaday lives that we keep going, going, that we don't take the time to step back and say uh, and think about how am I doing, how am I coming across, how am I treating other people? Okay, Tyler. Some other causes of instability. And this comes out of Michigan State University, uh, an institute called the High Conflict Institute. Um, and the, the person out there talked about uh, living in a culture of blame and disrespect. That our media emphasizes misbehavior. You turn on the news and what sells is negativity, what sells is misbehavior. Uh, often television shows, movies, what have you. A lot of our media these days is really has a negative bent. I've talked with clients who said, I no longer watch the news. It's just too much. It's just too much negativity. Uh, we focus on misbehavior. There are these things called mirror neurons in our frontal lobe. Um, and actually, when we see negativity, we sort of imagine what it would be like to be like that or to do that. And, and we kind of hooked into it. Um, and so it's a sort of negative factor of how it impacts us in terms of uh, even thinking about it in terms of ourselves and living in a culture of blame, uh, not taking personal responsibility. So another factor of cult being living in a culture that is increasingly about blaming and disrespect. Number two, political workplaces. Uh, these are workplaces that lack clarity about what type of behavior is valued. Is there value in acting in your own self-interest, getting ahead, competition, 
uh, uh, moving up in terms of power or rank and not thinking about others. Again, some workplaces are more about teamwork, about accomplishing in, in group settings and, and working together and setting that environment versus um, environments where perhaps like sales or other environments where competition um, comes into play. So political workplaces can also add to levels of incivility. Okay, Tyler. Talks about that we also uh, have increasingly uh, situations of high conflict in individuals. These personalities are increasing in our society. Uh, it's thinking that's all or nothing, sort of a black and white kind of thinking, right and wrong, sort of moralistic. And along with that will come unmanaged emotions. So again, these are uh, persons who, and I, and I think uh, as you feel frustrated, as you feel uncertain, thinking about things more black and white perspectives to feel a little bit better. But again, that can lead to incivility, uh, not being able to uh, be open to seeing other ideas and then allowing the emotion to go unmanaged. Uh, so emotional management, and we'll talk about that as we go along, uh, is also an important piece. Number four, the electronic communication. I talked about this earlier. So easy to lose sight. Uh, you don't see body language, tone of voice, it's open to interpretation. You may look at an email and say, what did the person mean? And, and actually simmer on that. And think, what was that all about? So electronic communication is less direct. It's harder to understand the intent. It can be an ambiguous um, as opposed to uh, uh, being face to face. And then uh, a significant factor is mental fatigue. You know, we all get drained throughout our workday. And when we get worn down, our willpower and our effort to suppress incivility decreases. So as we get uh, go through our days and we get worn down emotionally and mentally, uh, it, it's easier to snap. It's uh, easier to react to other people snapping. So uh, having awareness about how we're doing, we'll talk a little bit about that in terms of our emotional intelligence and mindfulness. But our mental fatigue in our workaday lives can wear us down to the point that we become incivil or are vulnerable to others being incivil to us. Okay, Miller. So one of the things that's happened over the years is employers have focused on training employees about workplace discrimination, harassment, and bullying. Most employees, when they get hired, may have to either sign off on a, uh, a form that they've read about the company policy about discrimination, harassment, bullying, or have to take a course or watch a video. Um, as those items have increased and been problematic in workplaces over the years, workplaces have uh, taken efforts to inform employees about what discrimination is, what harassment is, what bullying is, and what our company policy is about not being accepting of that. So traditionally, um, employers have focused on those things. They are important because they can lead to legal ramifications and formal sanctions, both for the employer as well as the employee. So, you know, I always advise people, as it says on the very bottom there, please see, read, or review your employer's policy manual. And it talks about how not to act or be, how not to be discriminatory or harassing or bullying. So be familiar with your company's policies. Uh, be familiar with those uh, areas. Employers have traditionally focused on training employees about what not to do, discrimination, harassing, and bullying. Next, Tyler. So that even with those trainings on what not to do, we have found that the number of people experiencing incivility at work has doubled over the past two decades. Uh, it's often subtle and not openly hostile. Uh, it can be low intensity and frequent, and includes things like sarcasm, rudeness, what have you. So this really mirrors what I talked about earlier, so that even with those trainings about let's not, we're, we can't discriminate, harass, bully, um, that incivility still uh, has increased. So that even with telling people how not to act, 
uh, we still have increases in, in incivility in many different ways, like are cited there and, and we talked about earlier. So it's kind of interesting that even with those trainings, again, that more foundational, that more subtle, that more benign interpersonal uh, uh, stressor uh, uh, has actually increased. Okay, Tyler. So the new focus has been, instead of talking to employees about how not to act, discrimination, harassment, bullying, but how to act. Talking about how do we be civil? Are we being civil, polite, reasonable, and respectful of one another? So teaching people, having educational programs like this one uh, and similar ones um, about how to be civil, not what not to do, but what to do. And the second important factor that, that, that companies have talked about and research have talked about is bystander intervention. So recognizing a potentially harmful situation or an interaction and responding to it to alter the outcome. So this is what we see in civility going down around us. Not necessarily to us between two other two two other people. I think it's a little bit different when it's happening to us how to respond to that. But bystander intervention is when we see it occurring in our environment, in our interpersonal relations at work. Do we intervene? And intervening uh, is seen as an important factor. So these are people about intervening and also how to be civil. Okay, Tyler. So to create respect and civility in your workplace. Let's go through a couple ways to do that. Before you act, consider the impact of your words and actions on others. This is like one of those golden rules. Think before you act. Take the time to do that. Part of this is being mindful of throughout your day, how am I doing? Am I mentally fatigued? Am I feeling tired? Is there something going on in my personal life that is impacting my mood that may come out on others? So before you act, consider your impact of your words and actions, especially if you're feeling uh, emotionally charged about something. Take the time to pause, take a breath, step away from the situation and think about how you want to approach it before just uh, doing it very spontaneously, which can often uh, uh, come off in a negative way. Number two, monitoring yourself, the respect you display uh, in your communication, both verbally, body language, and listening. Sometimes this is referred to as being the fly on the wall. So if I was fly on the wall and watching myself interact with another person, what am I seeing? Uh, how am I viewing myself? Uh, am I seeing someone that I would want to be interacting with or that I would want to be treated that way? So sort of stepping out and saying, well, uh, how am I coming across? Monitoring yourself. And again, that's partly monitoring yourself internally, how you're doing emotionally, what's going on in your life, your stress level, your fatigue level. Number three, understanding your triggers or hot buttons. So taking stock of that, and we all have them. What makes you angry and frustrated? And then being able to manage your reactions more appropriately. I think it's important even as you're sitting there thinking about what are my hot buttons? What are the things that kind of get to me? People that are a certain tone or, or a certain uh, verbiage that people use uh, or a certain language or a certain uh, a manner in which people approach me or what, what are the triggers that, that set me off? Because I need to be aware of those because as I encounter them, I need to have strategies to manage that. They actually say there are six hot buttons uh, out there that, that are most common. Let me have you write these down. They are fairness, respect, control, trust, criticism, and perfectionism. And what they say is that of those six, most of us are really tuned in on three of them. So you may want to think about which of those three really kind of get my goat? Which of those three am I vulnerable to or part of my hot button? So that as I encounter them, knowing that I could have emotional reactions to those, those are hot buttons for me. Some of it's about working through your issues related to those, but also being aware that when I encounter those, those are going to be my, my triggers and hot buttons. Okay, Tyler. Number four, take responsibility for your actions. 
practice self-restraint and anger management. I would also say emotional management. Again, this is our emotional intelligence for people of familiarity with that and mindfulness of being aware of what's going on for me internally and then being able to manage that emotion, taking responsibility, catching myself when I'm feeling like I'm, I'm getting geared up. And then what strategies do I use? Do I take a breath? Do I take a walk? Uh, do I do some relaxation? Do I use some meditation? Do I use some apps like Headspace or Calm to kind of get me to a better place? Um, to take responsibility for my actions as I'm encountering them. <clears throat> Number five, adopt a positive and solution-driven approach to resolving conflicts. As opposed to staying negative, staying positive, and, and think about what are some possible solutions to this issue or this conflict. So thinking ahead about what's going to make it better as opposed to staying stuck on the negativity. Number six, relying on facts rather than assumptions. Gather the relevant facts before you act. Um, not, being pro not being subjected to gossip. Maybe asking someone, where did you hear that or where did you get that information? Uh, to clarify what's real and what's not because you all probably know that rumor mills can occur and that can lead to lots of emotions and, and, and lots of maltreatment of each other. Uh, number seven, look at today's difficult situations in the big picture. A realistic overall view. There's a book out there called Don't Smet the Sweat the Small Stuff, and it's all small stuff. So step back and think about the big picture. Uh, what is that called? Uh, pick your battles. Um, there are certain times where I need to just step back and is this really relevant and important uh, in my life or in the work situation or the task at hand? Hey, Tyler. Number eight, create an inclusive work environment, one that recognizes and respects individual differences and qualities. This says that everyone has value and everyone has their own unique strengths. Uh, let's include them in the teamwork, looking for what those areas are for each of us and in our, in our uh, colleagues. And including everyone in that actually can help with the civility and, and again, away from incivility. Number nine, including others in your focus. Consider the needs of others, avoiding the perception that you are the center of the universe. We can all be vulnerable to that. We think our way is the right way, uh, our way is the way it should be. And that's totally opposite of accepting and respecting differences. We all differ in many ways. We're all unique in many ways. Um, and we are not the center of the universe. And so including that in teamwork actually is a, a significant way of helping build stability in a workplace. Number 10, each one influence one. This is sort of the pay it forward. Become a bridge builder and a role model for civility and respect. Respect yourself, respect others, and demonstrate it. Be how you'd like others to be. Thanks, Tyler. Now, with all I've mentioned about how instability is growing, when Shanwick Tate research I was talking about her polling, one of the things that they talked about, which is kind of interesting, is that they were they were finding out people were reporting that the workplace they're experiencing as a stability safe zone. That 92% of workplaces is very or somewhat civil, up from 86% in 2016. 27% uh, said civility has improved over the past few years. Uh, some of what they talked about was why, why, would that, why would people be reporting that? What's that about? And they were talking about it from a sense of leadership seen as civil. So as these problems increase, is it possible that leadership maybe in your company or your employment setting uh, or in your department uh, has taken steps to, to set more civil examples? that you feel more safe reporting uncivil conduct uh, and that management will handle those complaints. So uh, it's an interesting piece of people want to read about that and uh, talking about increase, but there are some people who are feeling that uh, actually uh, workplaces have become more civil. And I think it's very unique to your own environment, your own work setting, your own department in terms of where, where things are at for you, how people are building civility or not building it and, and what they're doing to contribute or not to it. Hey, Ty. I think I talked about earlier, uh, I'm sorry, 
resultado. Another factor I talked about earlier was bystander intervention, recognizing a potentially harmful situation or interaction, and choosing to respond in a way that could positively influence the outcome. It's traditionally taught and used to help prevent violence and sexual assault. It comes from that field. So intervening when we see things that are, that are going on. Next, Tyler. And the steps of bystander intervention, noticing an event, being observant, willing to see it. You know, sometimes we put our heads in the sand and we don't want to deal with it. Uh, so the first step is, do I notice something going on? Number two, identifying or recognizing the event as a possible problem. Stepping back and, and thinking about, is this a situation that uh, is problematic? Is action needed? Number three, deciding to take responsibility, deciding to act, becoming motivated and capable of acting on it. Uh, I think I'm going to do something about this. I think I'd like to intervene. Number four is deciding how I'm going to do that, how to safely intervene, because we don't want to put ourselves in unsafe situations. These are acquired skills. And, the, and number five is taking the action and responding. Okay, Tyler? So the three Ds of taking action are being direct. You can often say in a situation, are you okay? You can either say that to the perpetrator or to the victim uh, of an uncivil situation. Um, it sort of stops it, halts it, and asks somebody to sort of check in with themselves about, are they doing okay? Uh, being distracting, disrupting it uh, as a getaway. You know, perhaps saying, hey, Jane, I'd like to talk to you in my office about something, which kind of pulls it away from that situation, interrupts it, and, 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 and stops it from happening. So taking the time to think about a strategy that I might use to interrupt that situation to at least uh, stop it. The number three is to delegate it to someone else, uh, an authority, either to a supervisor or to HR. Uh, to go to someone and talk about if you're experiencing incivility um, and, and delegating that to management or supervisors or at a higher level where that can be dealt with uh, uh, at a different way. Okay, Tyler. What I thought I'd tack on at the end here was um, talking about, again, we haven't done civility in COVID times. I thought I'd tack on some pieces that I think are more um, important to where we are now. Most, many people are not in interpersonal workplaces many people are working from home a lot of communication now is going on virtually or by phone or by email so i came across a piece related to uh civility and virtual communication so these are just some items for you to think about you know as you've come across zoom conferences and what have you what do i wear on a video conferencing work call i mean certainly we all know we need to wear pants please remember to do that um but you know what else do we wear uh, my own personal preference is that, you know, if we're in a, in a we're on the clock and we're working, we, we should dress in a professional manner. Um, and I'm sure we've come up against people in meetings where we felt like, wow, they've really dressed down really casually. And, and I guess that's OK on some level. But I guess that tone is set by uh, your boss or set by your company. And, and maybe they've even done some pieces of that. But thinking about what do I wear on video conferencing calls? Uh, how can we stop speaking over one another? Uh, many many uh, Zoom meetings or other meetings have a host and, and they sort of manage the mute buttons and people can raise their hands through that piece and then uh, the host unmutes them. Uh, in my own department, we should have unmute each other as we sort of watch uh, when that opportunity can arise. Um, can you video meet without checking first by phone or email? I'm not experienced this, but they talk about it being like dropping in someone's house without calling first. Uh, my own sense is that people usually don't do videos unless they've accepted the invite. But we talked about uh, uh, getting permission first to do that. Can I leave my screen dark during a virtual meeting? Uh, some people find that rude. Uh, what's actually happening in that in that person's uh, arena? Are they really paying attention? Are they doing something different? So um, maybe leaving your screen dark is not is not seen as uh, as being very civil. How can I get off of one of these never-ending calls? Um, again, usually those calls are hosted by someone and, and they're in charge of the starting and the ending. And usually uh, those start and end times are, are set in advance. Should I email coworkers during off hours? One of the options is to, you can create an email, save it and send it uh, during whenever that person is working. A lot of people working different shifts. 
I know myself, if I get an email that was sent in, in the previous night, I'm just going to respond to it the next morning and, and people have awareness about it. Um, but thinking about off hours and, and emailing people from different shifts and when they're working, what if I hear babies crying or kids whining in the background or dogs barking? Um, what, one of the ways I've managed that is that um, would there be a better time to, to reschedule this, um, knowing that people are stressed out in these situations or having difficult times? And so um, asking people, maybe is it a better time to do this? Next, Tyler. Also similar to virtual is the emails. Um, consider the to list. Who am I sending this email off to? Uh, it's often easy to get uh, send it off to multiple people that we've uh, just sort of tagged on as, as people that it goes out to. And, Maybe considering only to sending it to people who we really want this to go to. A little formality goes a long way. Uh, proper addresses, proper salutations, uh, keeping it very professional and businesslike. Number three, ask, don't tell, especially if it's uh, uh, not a subordinate. You know, certainly with a subordinate, you might say, "I need you to this." And with other people, is can you please get uh, if you get the opportunity? Can you please? Would you please? You know, using those kind words in emails. Assume it will be forwarded. Uh, we often send off an email and not realizing that that could be forwarded to someone else or actually could be monitored by our employer in some way. Uh, write and informative and search, write and informative and searchable subject line. So in the subject line, make it something that's easy to see and understand. Maybe you put respond and need it will catch an attention. But as you're searching back through your emails, if you can see that subject line, uh, it's easier to, to figure out what that was and to track it back down. Be clear and concise as opposed to very wordy. Uh, don't put emotion in. Um, keep that out as much as possible. That doesn't belong professionally. And put the main topic at the top. Usually when we're writing an email, we could have processed through our thoughts in the email and put the main point at the bottom. Think about putting it at the top, which actually is helpful to people reading it. to kind of know what's going to follow from there as opposed to uh, getting lost in the uh, what you're going through. Okay, Tyler. And the last piece. So if you had to sum it all up, being civil is how I act. And in many ways, it's the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have done unto you. Uh, the golden rule is still one of the best pieces of uh, we can live by, one of the best rules we can live by. And the other one is helping others, intervening. If this was a friend or a family member, would I want someone else to act and intervene and, and be helpful in some way? So we're running up against the end. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. I don't see, I don't have the chat open, Tyler, so I don't know if there are, if I should open that, um, if there have been questions or comments. But, uh, and, and also there is, our, again, our, our uh, phone numbers, website, and address. So if people have any questions or comments at this time, um, more than willing to entertain them. Yeah, so people can feel free to enter questions into the question tab or the chat tab. Um, and I've also opened it up that you're able to unmute yourselves as well if you'd like to ask one um, through your microphone. You know, as people formulate their thoughts, I'll just tag on a little piece here at the end as well. Now, I've talked about how to be civil myself, how to monitor myself, um, how to keep what I'm presenting as civil as possible, the kind of factors that feed into being uncivil on my part and on other people's part. And I talked about the bystander intervention, intervening when other people, and you see it happening to other people. But one of the things we didn't get into, and it's really almost a whole topic by itself, is how do, what do I do when it's, someone is being uncivil to me. You know, there's, there are workshops out there called how to deal with difficult people or deal with rude people. Again, they're almost fully on their own. One of the things I, I like to talk about just in that regard is that thinking about, again, rudeness is, is nothing new. It, it, it occurs. 
Uh, it's been around forever. But I think one of the things to step back and think, perhaps, uh, to, certainly not to take it personally necessarily, that perhaps this person's having a bad day. So could ask, are you okay? Is everything okay with you? Um, checking in with that person. Uh, I think another thing is to ask someone, if you've heard something that came off in a certain way, you may say, I'm not quite sure if I heard you correctly. It, it, it sounds like you're saying this, or it sounds like you've said that. A am I hearing you correctly? So oftentimes checking in with the other person and gives them a chance to step back and, and, and think about how they came across or what they said. So always checking in with the other person in an empathic way. Are you okay? Or it sounds like you're saying this. I'm not sure if I've heard that right. Um, in some situations, calling people out that, that's really come across as rude. Uh, uh, please don't please don't speak to me that way. Please don't treat me that way. Um, every situation is unique. I don't think that you react to rudeness the same way depending on the person, the environment. I think you step back and think about how do I want to deal with, with this situation? And those are just some ideas on reacting to rudeness when we encounter it. So Rick, we do have a uh, question that came in in the chat kind of along those lines. Um, it says, an employee keeps emailing me in a rude manner. What do I do? And then she also mentioned when I checked in, she said, yes, I meant to speak to you that way. I meant to speak to you that way. I might still check in on that is, um, um, is, there a reason why, is there a reason why you meant, you, 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 you prefer to speak to me that way? Is there a reason for that? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. So I, I would still be checking back in with that person. Yeah, I meant to speak to that way. Um, not, not just a simple why, uh, but um, in an inquisitive kind of way. Um, can you clarify more about why you felt uh, you wanted to do that? Or can you be more clear about what the purpose of that is? Or help me understand um, why you wanted to come across that way? So I think getting more clarity, it sounds like in that situation, that they came back with a, an email that was, yes, I wanted to be rude. Um, go check back in with what's that about? You know, again, in a, in a, in a soft way, um can you can you help me understand why you wanted to why why you needed to do or why you wanted me to understand it that way so i would say checking back we have a few other questions in um that i could probably answer can we obtain a copy of the presentation and will this be available to listen to again um yes we will send out an email to everyone in attendance today um that will have a link to the meeting recording and a copy of a PDF version of the presentation as well. Um, you can certainly feel free to share that with um, any of your colleagues or peers. Um, it'll probably come out um, sometime later this week. And I don't see any other questions in the chat as of right now, Rick. Again, if, if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask, feel free to do so, or the, the chat is open as well. Yeah, with just a few minutes left, uh, I would also let people know that uh, if they if you have any questions or comments or concerns, uh, always feel free to reach out to us at Preferred EAP. Again, the numbers are there. People should feel free to reach out to me in, in particular. My name is, again is Rick. I'm the only Rick there. so. If you have any questions about anything I've tossed out today or or comments or, or, or want a quick consultation on something related to civility, feel free to reach out to me. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So uh, even if you've had a question or are thinking about something and didn't feel comfortable getting it out today or, or don't have time to get it out today, uh, feel free to reach out to me or to us at EAP and, and uh, we're available for you uh, to answer that or act as a consult or, or be available to be helpful in any way that we can. Rick, it seems like we have another question that's come in. Um, what if you report a problem and nothing changes? Um, no action has been taken against the aggressor. Uh, that, then what do you do? 
Yeah, it's a tough question. Uh, and I've, we've gotten that scenario uh, n- numerous times. It, you know, every work situation is different. Every management and HR situation is different. Um, I would say, unfortunately, it's not uncommon that that situation occurs, that we've talked about a concerning situation and and, and nothing seems to happen. Um, I, I think first, first off, I think to return to the person you reported to, and and inquire about um, where things are in the process. Uh, are there plans to address the situation in any way? Um, what are the protocols for addressing the situation? I would go back and, and re-inquire about what's going on or what has happened. Um, um, you might say, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful that this situation will continue to occur. Can you please advise me on, on how I should uh, address this situation or deal with this situation if it occurs again. So I would go back to the source, but you know, there are many situations where employees have gotten in a situation where nothing changes after multiple reports or what have you. And, you know, one of the things you do is perhaps develop just resilience. I mean, it depends on where you're at with that position or that job. I know I've worked with people who have said, I can't survive in this situation. It's, it's, it's risen to perhaps even harassment, discrimination, or bullying. And then, you know, I'm not going to survive in this situation. I'm not going to exist in this situation. So many people think about, I need to leave this, this, this workplace because this environment is not for me. Um, and the other option is, is building resilience is another way to respond to civility. And there's some articles out there about that, becoming resilient to, to incivility. And I think we're up against the hour. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone for their uh, attendance today. I hope some of what you found today will be helpful and uh, uh, will be helpful in your situation and and involving uh, civilian workplace. And I wish everyone all the best. Please stay safe.